I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about uh, teams and team culture. I know there have been a few talks so far uh, today and yesterday about culture, but hopefully I've got something new uh, that I can add to that conversation. Uh, but before I get into it, uh, I have to start with a couple of apologies. Uh, so first apology, for those of you who saw the picture they made of me, you were probably expecting Santa Claus. Uh, so sorry to disappoint you, no presents for you today. Uh, I'm not quite round enough or grey enough to be Santa yet, but maybe next year. Uh, second apology, um, so you can see my, uh, my current job title, so I'm an Agile trainer and metal head. Uh, that's actually my real job title at the moment. Uh, and last week I went to a metal gig uh, and I found out that it's possible to headbang so hard that you end up in the hospital needing to get your head examined. Uh, so I did lose a couple of key days of prep for this talk, uh, and I'm mostly just telling you that so that I can guilt trip you into not judging me too harshly if I forget my words at all. Uh, but there's some information on the screen about me, I won't bore you with all the details. Uh, the main stuff that I want to call out is I'm currently working as a trainer, so I help people get their Scrum and SAFE certifications. Don't judge me for the SAFE, please. Um, and I do a lot of offering uh, free mentoring, coaching, training to aspiring Scrum Masters, new Scrum Masters. Uh, my personal belief is that there's a lot of snake oil and a lot of bad practice out there. Uh, and so Scrum Masters getting a good first start is really, really important. So if you are new on your Scrum journey and you're looking for help and, and someone to bounce ideas off of, please do connect with me on LinkedIn and, and reach out. I'd love to help any way that I can. But uh, I am not here today to talk about me. I am here to tell you a story. And this is a story about a company called Vital Technologies. So imagine a big international company of the kind that's got offices all over the world, uh, many, many teams doing many different things. They build software, they build hardware. But at this point in time, they're looking for uh, help with two particular teams that, that need a Scrum Master. So these teams are doing Scrum, they think, uh, but they've never really had an experienced Scrum Master. They've never really worked on their Scrum practice, and they don't have anyone internally that can, that can help them to do this. And so they decide that they need to go out to market and look for someone really experienced that can, that can help them out. And this is where our main character comes in, Gilbert. So Gilbert is a Scrum Master. So he's been doing this for many, many years. He's, he's helped many teams to improve their Scrum practice. Uh, and at this point, he gets brought in to Vital Technologies on a fixed-term contract, which from Gilbert's perspective, this is great, because a fixed-term contract means that he has to keep a certain goal in mind. He needs to help these teams to become self-managing, self-organizing, so that they can continue to thrive with their scrum practice long after he steps away. And so as Gilbert's brought into the organization, he meets another few key players in, in our story. Firstly, he meets Pete, the product owner. So Pete, he's called a product owner, but he really doesn't do a lot of the, the traditional product owner stuff that us great scrum practitioners know all about. So he used to work in the team, he knows the product and he knows the platform inside and out, technology, how it works, all that stuff. But he doesn't really have that much control over what's being built or how. He's mostly just being directed by management and acting as a go-between between the scrum teams and, and management about the next set of requirements. Manny, on the other hand, is our other character, and he's the manager. So he's been at the organization even longer than Pete, pretty much since it was, it was being built up from the, from the bottom. And Manny's always had a lot of control. So everyone in all these teams that we're about to talk about, they report through to Manny. He's the one who does hiring and firing. He's the one who does their monthly reviews, their end of year performance reviews, decides if they get a pay rise. So for the most part, he's the one in control of what's going on. And the two teams that Gilbert has been hired to help out a Team Aqua and Team Ignis. So both of these teams, they're working on the same product, same platform, same technology, and they share a product owner in Pete, and soon a Scrum Master in Gilbert. And everything else about the teams is, is basically the same. So they share a, sp a sprint boundary, starting and ending the sprints at the same time. Uh, they have their sprint reviews together, uh, and every other technical product constraint is, is basically the same in both of these two teams. And so as Gilbert gets in and starts spending a bit of time with the teams and observing what's going on and, and looking for patterns, first thing he notices, Team Aqua, they're quite a quiet team. So they sit in their corner of the office, and there's not a lot of movement, there's not a lot of energy, there's a lot of focus, a lot of headphones on and keyboards tapping away. And the developers in this team, they've been with the, with the company for many, many years. So they know the technology, they know the product, uh, and they know how to get stuff done. And this team, this, this team is loved by Manny, the manager. In fact, Manny says to Gilbert on his first day, well, last week when we were getting ready for our, our big release, we found a bug at the last minute. And uh, 
when I went to, to Team Aqua to, to ask for help, one of the developers stayed up until 10 p.m. solving the bug, fixing the problem so we could go ahead with the release. Aren't they awesome? Cool. It's Team Ignis on the other, other side. Very different energy. So this, this side of the office is, is loud and it's energetic. And this is because a lot of the developers in Team Ignis are much newer. They haven't been here as long. Uh, they are often quite new developers themselves, so this might be their first development job. So this team's been added to support the platform much later in its life. Now Manny, he thinks that this team, they're a bit problematic. So remember that bug that, that we found last week? Well, first we went to Team Ignis and we said, hey, can you, can you solve this for us? And they insisted we should just push back the release. That's not very customer-centric, right? So it's this team, he tells Gil, but this is the team that you really need to help. This is the team that needs your coaching support. Gilbert doesn't say much, he just takes this information on board. And so again, Gilbert is spending some time with the teams, figuring out what's going on. A couple of other patterns he starts to notice. So really, the teams are just doing zombie scrum. So there's a mess of JIRA tickets. It's being managed by Pete, the product owner, uh, all sorts of items and epics, and, and they get pushed into the team at random intervals depending on what they need to do at, at the time. Sprints themselves would be things like documentation sprints or testing sprints. So the plans that the team are working towards are essentially project plans. They span several months. They have fixed uh, scope, fixed deliverables, fixed dates. And the teams are just rolling through them in these things that they're calling sprints. So there's no increments, there's no sprint goals, nothing here that really looks a whole lot like Scrum other than maybe some of the ceremonies. So Gilbert realizes, obviously, he's got his work cut out for him. There's a lot of coaching here that he needs to do. And what I'm about to share with you are some of the, the key stories that followed, some of the learning moments that Gilbert experienced. So the first thing Gilbert saw when he started attending the team retrospectives is that every week or every sprint, the team was having the same good and bad retro in the same format. You know, what went well, what didn't go well, what are we going to improve? And they generate a list of problems, and then they put them all on sticky notes. But they wouldn't really create a plan for change. They wouldn't really try to uh, own any, any new ways of working or experiment. They would just list their problems. And it was usually the same problems that were coming up, as you can imagine. Right? Every sprint, same problems, same, same stuff. Gilbert obviously realizes this is a key coaching moment. He can help the team to get better at retrospecting, uh, hopefully to take ownership of, of what they're doing and, and come up with some plans for change. So as well as encouraging the team to think differently and, and to own the problems, come up with some experiments, to support the change in the way of thinking, he decides to change the retro formats. So every, every sprint, different retro format. Maybe he brings in the four L's or the sailboat or radars or bets, right? Well, I'm sure you've all got many you could share. And so immediately Team Ignis, this, this clicks for them. It makes sense. And they start enjoying the retrospectives a lot more. So they like the experimentation, they like the new way of, of thinking about problems, and the conversation, it starts to flow naturally. They begin creating novel solutions, experiments, and they own them throughout the sprint. So they're real plans for change, and they start doing stuff differently almost immediately. Awesome, right? Team Aqua, on the other hand, they don't really seem to like this. They don't engage with the new formats. And, and when Gilbert asks questions like, well, what are you going to do differently? What, what experiments could we create? They just look at each other, puzzled. When they're asked what they can do differently, Gilbert's usually met with silence. It's clear to Gilbert that really what the team wants is to just list their problems, give them to Gilbert, and, and leave it at that. But Gilbert's not perturbed. He decides he's going to keep trying and coaching the team towards doing something differently and, and changing the retro format to encourage new ways of thinking. And then one day, uh, Team Retro comes around. The developer's pour pouring into the room, and there's a new format on the board. And one of the developers doesn't even sit down. One of the developers looks at the board, and he says, why is the format changing again? Gilbert says, well, you know, change the format, change our way of thinking. Maybe we can get some, some new ideas going. The, the, uh, the developer, he just scrunches his face, and he, he says, no, 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 I feel like a lab rat. Every week we come in here, and the format's changed. Nothing important changes, nothing good changes. It's just the same problems every week. Gilbert thinks, and he says, yeah, you're, you're right. So." What are you going to do differently this week to, to make sure that something changes? And the developer, he says, well, you still haven't changed any of the things that we told you about last week. Gilbert thinks, and he says, sure, but what are you going to do differently this week to make sure that something changes? The developer, it looks maybe like something's about to click in his brain. 
But instead, he huffs and he storms out and he slams the door behind him. So Gilbert dejectedly asks the team, if you want to just skip the retro this week? And of course they did, so they all just got up and sorted out. So Gilbert was a bit sad, right? Not the outcome he wanted. He hadn't really gotten the team to a new place. But he did learn something. He learned something about the culture of these two teams. It seemed like Team, Ag team Ignis, they had a culture of experimentation, a culture of change, and they wanted to do things differently. Team Aqua, they had a culture of keeping things the same. They don't want to experiment, and they certainly just want to hand problems over to someone else. Okay. So Gilbert falls that away, and he moves on to another problem that, that maybe he can solve. So as we mentioned earlier, Jira is a bit of a mess, right? A, a few sprints in, and it's clear that there's, there's tip tickets, there's epics, there's work all over the place, uh, no real cohesion, uh, and the team mostly just goes to Pete, the product owner, and says, give us something to do, and, and he'll throw some tickets in. Often that's happening in the middle of the sprint, not even, in, not even in sprint planning. And as a result, the team has come to see the number of tickets that they close as their metric of success. So when they do go to Pete, the product owner, and say, hey, we've run out of work, give us more tickets, they see that as a good thing. They go with smiles on their faces. And that includes bug fixes. Interesting. So Gilbert gets to coaching, and he starts working with Pete, the product owner. And he creates a backlog, a real product backlog, the kind that's got a product goal and priorities and customer value and all this cool stuff that, that we love to talk about in Scrum. Teams are now expected to pull in work from that backlog. No more confusing mess of Jira where they don't need to go. Now they can go into the backlog and see clearly what's prioritized. And they're expected to create sprint goals and measure their, expect the, uh, their success based on the achievement of those sprint goals. Immediately, Team Ignis, they, they take to this approach. It makes sense to them. So they start forming sprint goals. They start thinking about customer value. They start thinking about how they can deliver increments during a sprint. As a result, they realize that sprint planning has to become a collaboration with the, with the product owner, with Pete, so that they can come up with some real powerful sprint goals. And additionally, they realize, well, now we actually have to refine our backlog, right? Because this is a hard thing to do in a, in a sprint planning session, so now we're going to have to do some refinement so that when it comes to planning, we, we can create some sprint goals. Awesome, right? Team Aqua, though, they don't like this so much. They just keep asking, well, what are we going to work on? Tell us what to work on. Give us some tickets. And they don't want to create sprint goals. Even the, the idea of a sprint goal just seems a bit strange, bizarre to them. And so Gilbert continues trying to coach Team Aqua. We're in sprint planning. Let's come up with a sprint goal. Let's think about some value we can deliver to our customers, right? All that good stuff. And one of the developers from Team Aqua, he says, all we can do this sprint is some documentation. We have to document the architecture so that next week, next week we can, we can build something. But this week, all we could possibly do is document the architecture. Gilbert thinks maybe, but you know, could we? Maybe break this down into something a bit smaller, a different slice of customer value we can actually deliver in the sprint. And the developer from Team Aqua, pfft, no. Don't be silly. It's not even technically possible to deliver incrementally on our platform, he says. Just doesn't make any sense. And before Gilbert can even respond, the developer follows up. And besides, even if we could deliver incrementally, our customers don't want that. They don't want an increment of value this sprint. They want the thing that we planned six months ago, the thing that we promised them. That's, that's what we have to deliver. So we need to do the documentation so we can get there, right? Well, you should have seen the look on Pete, the product owner's face. Because not only did he know that this developer had never actually spoken to a customer, so that was an interesting insight, uh, but Team Ignis, by this point, they had started building some stuff incrementally. Not necessarily easy, but they'd been doing it. So we knew it was technically possible. Interesting. But again, Gilbert tries coaching the team, and it seems as though he's not going to get anywhere successful. And he files away what he's learned. It looks as though Team Ignis have a culture of ownership of outcomes. They want to change the way they work, and they want to do that to support the delivery of value to customers. Team Aqua, though, they seem to have a culture of following plans, of following instructions. OK. So the next problem that Gilbert decides to try and work on with the team is they are starting to, to deliver incrementally, or at least to try, and merge issues keep popping up. So almost every sprint, we're finding that the developers are having to spend several, several hours resolving merge conflicts because of their long-lived branches that are, that are spanning many, many releases. 
So both teams mention this in their retrospectives. Team Ignis, they recognize this is a problem they need to solve. They have a deep conversation at the retrospective and, and they realize the branching strategy clearly is causing us some issues. So we've got all these versions, they outlive multiple sprints, we've got to merge them, it's creating all these conflicts. So maybe we could try an experiment, right? Maybe we could move to some trunk-based development. But in order to do that, we need to talk with Team Aqua, get us all on the same page and do the same thing. Concurrently, in another sprint review, uh, sorry, in another retrospective, uh, Team Aqua, they insist that the problem primarily just lies with Team Ignis. They don't need to change anything. It's, it's Team Ignis's fault. But Team Aqua, no, no problem solved. Team Ignis decides, let's book some time. Let's have a session with, with both teams. And so the session begins. Team Ignis and Team Aqua together in the same room. And Team Ignis, they bring the problem forward. And they say, hey, so we're having these uh, merge conflicts. So we wanted to talk about the branching strategy. And immediately, one of the developers from Team Aqua says, what do you mean, merge conflicts? Well, you know, those merge conflicts that we've just been dealing with you know, yesterday and last week and the week before. No, 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 there are no merge conflicts, the developers say. Well, that's a bit strange. So Team Ignis, they keep trying to rephrase and, and have the conversation, you know, describe the problem that, that they're experiencing. But Team Aqua keep insisting, no, no, there are no merge issues. There are no merge issues. And eventually, Gilbert, who's listening in on the conversation, he realizes something. He looks around and says, oh, this room that we're in right now, this is the room that the teams have their retrospectives in. And he gets up and he walks over to a, to a whiteboard and he, he pulls off a sticky note. He holds it up. And on the sticky note, it says, merge issues. And you'll never guess, it was Team Aqua that had created this sticky, this sticky in, their, uh, in their retrospective. And the developer who was, who was pushing back sees this. And he says, no, 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 we didn't mean merge issues. What we meant is there are problems with the merging because of the bad changes that Team Ignis is making. If they just stopped making bad changes, we wouldn't have a problem. It's not the branching strategy. The branching strategy doesn't need to change. Don't be silly. Okay, well, as you can imagine, Team Ignis, not super happy with that, realized this probably wasn't going to go anywhere, and they decided to, to leave it and try another way to solve this problem. So again, not a great outcome. Gilbert, though, has once again filed away some things that he learned about the teams. So it seems that Team Ignis have a culture of problem resolution. They want to find a way to solve the problem. They want to own that. They want to take it to the team, do what, whatever they can to get it solved. Team Aqua, they just want to blame others for the problems. doesn't matter if it gets solved as long as it's not our fault. Great. So again, Gilbert's filed that away, and he moves on to another problem that perhaps he can solve. So like we mentioned, Gilbert's here on a fixed-term contract. He knows that at some point in the future, uh, he's going to be stepping away. And he wants these teams to be able to continue to, to have an effective Scrum practice without him, right? still be able to run the, the Scrum events. And next week, he's going to be on leave. Perfect opportunity. So he talks to the teams, and he says, you know, don't just cancel your retrospective. Go ahead and have the retrospective without me. And then if you need anything when I get back, we can, we can talk. And they agree. So Gilbert, he takes some time off, goes away, has a few sips of a Mai Tai, and comes back feeling nice and refreshed on a Monday morning. And the first thing he sees is that Team Ignis appear to have had a very successful retrospective. And he can tell because their scrum board has some new items on it, some nice color-coded, different from the regular stories that they work on, representing some stuff they've decided that they want to change for the upcoming sprint. Cool. And so the daily scrum starts for the day, and Gilbert, he's standing with the team, and they have their discussion, and one of the developers, he says, oh, so we had our retro, and this problem's come up, and we need to borrow some hardware from another team. You know, our testing is really difficult, and if we had this hardware, it would make the testing easier. But we don't really know who to talk to, we don't know who to ask for help, so you know, could, could you help us facilitate that conversation? And Gilbert says, yeah, I, I can do that, absolutely. And shortly after, Second daily scrum of the day begins. Team Aqua, always Gilbert's favorite. So their board, it didn't seem to have any new retro items on it. There's nothing near the board that, that seems to represent anything that they've decided to change. And Team Aqua, they start to have their usual daily scrums. They all stand in a circle, and one by one, they list off all the stuff that they did yesterday that prevented them from getting anything done. And once everyone's had a, a good, old, good old chat, they, they wander off. No mention of retrospectives, no mention of change, no new experiments. 
doesn't seem like they really had much to offer. So Gilbert goes and sits back at his desk, intending to get some work done, maybe have a look around and see if, if any retro items have been hidden away somewhere that, that haven't been mentioned. And a developer from Team Aqua approaches his desk. And he notices that the developer has something in his hand. It's a pile of post-it notes. And he comes over and he hands them to, to Gilbert. And Gilbert sees that they have things written on them, vague statements like, we didn't finish testing on JIRA number 234, and we still don't have anyone to do our release notes. Okay. And as the developer hands these to Gilbert, he says, these are yours. And he walks away. Interesting. So, right, again, Gilbert, he's learned something. Team Ignis, they seem to have a culture of, of self-organization. They want to manage their practice. They want to do things without Gilbert, but they know when to go to him for help. Team Aqua, they have a culture of management. They want to have someone else tell them what to do to run their events and to solve their problems for them. So again, Gilbert, he takes note. The sticky notes sat on his desk for quite a while, and he moves on to another problem maybe he can solve. So by this point, Gilbert knows that quality in this product is, is a bit of an issue. So there are loads of bugs being raised. Every, every sprint for each one or two user stories being closed, for every few user stories being closed, uh, there's twice as many bugs being raised. So he's been talking to the team about all sorts of cool things that might help in shift left testing and test driven development. Mostly though, he's just been trying to get the team to take ownership for quality. So no developers, no testers, a single scrum team that's together responsible for building quality in. Sounds like a crazy idea, right? So immediately Team Ignis, as you probably can see the pattern, this makes sense to them. So they enjoy the approach. They start looking for potential points of failure, thinking about the things that will trip them up and, and trying to build quality in from the start. They start actually delivering increments that meet the definition of done and are high quality with no, no bugs attached. Awesome. It gets so good that Gilbert's pleased that when he's sitting in on a refinement session for the team, they start whiteboarding some potential automated tests that they could run with some failure scenarios and what that would look like before they've even started planning to deliver the work. Great. Team Aqua, less on board with the approach. They don't, they don't seem to, to want to all be responsible for quality, because there's some clear roles and specialists in, in the team. But they do agree, begrudgingly, to an experiment. So what they're going to stop doing is just raising bugs against a story and closing the story and keeping the bugs open for many, many sprints. What they agree to do is, within the sprint, actually work through solving the bugs, solving the problems that are found, uh, and only closing a, a user story when it actually meets the definition of done and, and is of a high quality. Cool. But during the sprint, Gilbert's sat at his desk and he's doing some of his usual work. And he hears a tester, tester approaching a developer in the team. And the tester says, hey, hey, can you, can you have a look at this? So um, when you press this button twice in a row, uh, the whole system crashes and the user gets logged all the way out to the beginning, and they, they have to start the process from the beginning. Uh, and the developer looks a bit puzzled and says, well, don't press it twice then. <laughs> Great advice, right? Uh, and the tester, as you can imagine, says, well, y sure, but you know, it, it shouldn't do that. No, the developer says, it's, it, that's exactly how it was built. It's meant to work that way. And besides, there was nothing in the ticket about stopping it from crashing when you press the button twice. If you wanted it to not crash when you press the button twice, that should have been the ticket. It's way too late to fix that now. So tester, obviously a little bit confused, says, OK, I know, but we, we did agree that this is what we're going to do, right? It, it's not working. It's not high quality. I can't mark this as done. And the developer just says, raise a ticket. I'm busy. And before the tester can respond, he puts on his headphones, and he turns his back, and he swivels his chair and ignores her. So Gilbert could see how upset the tester was. Right? She knew that this was not a high quality increment that we were building. She knew that the ticket wasn't ready to be marked as done. Uh, but the developer didn't want to listen to her. She didn't know what to do. So she walked away distraught. It looked like perhaps fighting back tears. So again, we've learned something. 
Team Ignis, it seems, they have a culture of collaboration. They want to own quality. They want to make sure they're building the right thing, the right product, in a way that will satisfy customers. Team Aqua, on the other hand, they have a handoff culture. They want to do their bit. They want to do their development or their testing and hand it off, at least some of the team, it seems. So by this point, many months have passed, right? Gilbert's been spending a lot of time with both of these teams trying to solve these problems. And he started to develop a bit of a backlog. These are some of these cultural issues that seem to exist within Team Aqua in particular. So Team Aqua, they have a culture of keeping things the same. They don't seem to want to change. They have a culture of following instruction. They have a culture of blame, of management, they have a handoff culture. All of these seem to be specific to Team Aqua. They're not something that has been quite as bad when dealing with Team Ignis. And so Gilbert, he's doing some root cause analysis. He's trying to figure out, well, why is it? Why is it that when I do the same basic thing, right, use my same coaching techniques in these two different teams, I'm getting these completely different outcomes? What's going on? So he's thinking about it, and then he notices something. Hmm. Do you remember this slide? Back from the beginning when we met the teams. So Team Aqua, he's loved by Manny the manager, right? So he spends a lot of time with them. He talks to them throughout the day. He spends time in the team area. He sometimes has lunch with them. He goes to all the scrum events. His office, his personal office, is right next to the team area where Team Aqua do their work. And you'll remember how excited he was talking about them when he introduced them to Gilbert. And Gilbert realizes, well, in, in the few months that I've been here, I don't actually recall Manny the manager once going and spending time in Team Ignis's team area. If he needs to talk to them, he sends a message and someone from Team Ignis gets called into his office and he has a chat with them there. So he doesn't attend most of their events. He mostly just kind of ignores them. And so to Gilbert, this starts to look like a pattern. It seems like Manny, the manager, has many, many expectations of Team Aqua, but little to any expectations of Team Ignis. And this perhaps starts to explain some of the patterns that Gilbert is seeing. Because you see, Manny is the one that when he sees the way that Team Aqua works is changing, he goes to them and asks why. He wants an explanation for why things are, are being done differently, because it wasn't that way when he used to do the, do the development work. It's Manny that praises and rewards the team when they drop everything they're doing and just do whatever it is he's asked for. Remember how excited he was about that bug that was being fixed at 10 p.m.? What a great me metric of success. So it's Manny that goes to Team Aqua when something's not right, asking for a, uh, an explanation of a problem, and who will believe them the second they say it's someone else's fault, and he'll walk away and he'll leave them alone. Manny always has more work to give to Team Aqua. If they run out of work and Pete, the product owner, says, hey, you need to finish testing or fixing bugs on this thing that's in progress, Manny will just say, oh, you could just work on this, because I've got lots of things that, that I'd like done. And maybe the most important, Manny is the one doing the performance reviews. Manny is the one that ultimately decides whether our developers, our team members, are getting a pay rise at the end of the year, whether they're going to get fired if they're, if they're not performing. And it's Manny that sees number of user stories closed as a primary measure of success for the developers. But separately, the testers, it's number of bugs being raised. More bugs being raised, better. More user stories being closed, good. Hmm. And so Gilbert's thinking about this, and he realizes a lot of people over the years, they've, they've talked about this relationship between culture and behavior, right? We've heard a lot of it here uh, at Agile, by example. So which do you go after first, right? Do you, do you try to change culture and then hope that behavior follows? Do you go after behavior, changing that in the short term, and then culture follows afterwards, right? Chicken, egg, who knows? Well, at least in this case, what Gilbert noticed was the pattern always seemed to be one of expectation. Because in Team Aqua, for every cultural issue that was creating a negative outcome, there was always an expectation of them coming from somewhere, usually outside the team, and usually Manny the manager. But the team themselves were then reinforcing that expectation and began to expect it of each other. And that's how their behavior became entrenched. And what might we call entrenched behavior? Culture, maybe? So Gilbert realized this was clearly what he had to solve. Right? This, this was the thing that, that seemed to be stopping his coaching approach from working with, with Team Aqua. 
So you have to break the link between expectation and culture, stopping that behavior from becoming in entrenched. So one of the first things he had to do was work with, with Manny, some coaching with, with Manny the manager. So he was asked to stop attending team events, let the team do those things by themselves, as in the scrum events. And if he wanted something that he needed to have done, he was to talk to Pete, the product owner, or Gilbert, the scrum master, first. It wasn't to go straight to the team. Sprint reviews were changed to be outcome focused. So Manny was asked to reward the teams based on how they worked together to achieve the sprint goal. Not how many stories were completed and how many bugs were raised. Did we achieve a sprint goal? Did it deliver some value to our customers? Teams stopped counting tickets as a result, right? The sprint reviews were no longer caring about it, so they stopped caring about it. Instead, at sprint reviews, we looked at things like feature roadmaps. What stories that deliver value to customers have we actually achieved? And then finally, limiting work in progress. So the ability for teams to actually pull things into their sprints, mid-sprint, was completely taken away, technologically speaking. Special rule in JIRA. Have to go to Pete, the product owner, if you want something new to do. And Pete, the product owner, was coached to say, do you have work in progress? Because if the answer is yes, well, cool, we've got stuff to do, right? Well, it's just testing. Then we test. Remarkable. And so this immediately started to have some impact on, on Team Aqua. Because the culture of keeping things the same, well, that just couldn't survive anymore, right? Because they had to work differently under this new system. This, this wouldn't, the way that they'd been working before just wasn't going to keep working for them. And they could no longer follow instructions because no one was giving them instructions. They stopped getting told what to do. They had to plan their own work. And they couldn't place blame. Well, they could, it just didn't do them any good because what we cared about was, did we achieve a sp sprint goal? No. Well, that was because, oh, it doesn't matter because we didn't achieve a sprint goal. We failed as a team, what are we going to do differently next sprint? And without Manny as a crutch, the team had to learn to self-manage. They could no longer just knock on Manny's door and say, hey, have you got some extra work we can do? Or what do you think we should do with this? Manny was coached to have the team talk to the team amongst the developers, the scrum master, and the product owner. And so I could began to realize they had to start solving problems regardless of the specialism, right? You could no longer, as a developer, get away with saying, well, I'm, I'm a developer, uh, you know, I write code, I don't, I don't test. Well, no, we, we have to figure out a way to help each other to solve problems. And they still had their specialisms, obviously, testing still very important, writing code still very important, but if there was no code to write, you had to help with testing, and if there was no testing to do, you had to help with writing code in whatever way you could, right? As, as small or as, or as little as that contribution could be. And I wish I could say that that just solved all the problems overnight. It, it didn't. Uh, it was still very hard and very contentious. A lot of the coaching techniques, a lot of the ideas that, that Gilbert was bringing to the team didn't go quite where they wanted to, to be. And most of the work itself still was very, very big, and it was rolling from sprint to sprint, and it wasn't always customer value-based. And the team still did raise a lot of bugs. That didn't just go away, but it did reduce. So you might say a glimmer of hope, though, is starting to appear. So the team did start refining the backlog because they knew that that was going to be a requirement because if they got to sprint planning, no extra help. They had to think about quality. They had to think about delivering sprint goals. And they started showing real customer value at sprint reviews because, again, it was the only thing that anyone cared about. So if they wanted to be successful, that's what they had to aim for. And they started collaborating to solve problems in the sprint. Now, it wasn't always easy, and the tension between the sort of developers and testers was still there to some degree. But again, knowing that no one else was going to solve this problem and they couldn't place blame, they had to start changing their behavior. And so this is what Gilbert learned. When behavior is met with expectation, that's when it becomes culture. So expectations can come from anywhere, right? Anyone can expect anything of anyone. But management expectation, expectation from the people who, who are responsible for our performance reviews and the, the hiring and the firing, those are powerful expectations, and those can have an enormous impact on the way that teams behave. So if you want to change that expectation, you have to change what you measure, and you have to change what you reward. That's really where the expectations come in. And then, importantly, for that to be successful, you have to help managers to understand the difference between management and leadership empowering teams over directing them. If you can do that, maybe you'll get some change. 
So that's the end of my story uh, between you and me. That was actually all a true story, more or less. Uh, so I changed some names, changed some of the, the basics to make it more story friendly. But all of that really did happen in pretty much the way it was described, as strange as it sounds. And so you can probably tell that means that I was Gilbert. So those are the abridged version, versions of some of the lessons that, that I learned. So I hope there was some nuggets of, of help in there. I, I hope the experience was as helpful to you as it was to me. Uh, and thank you, and I'd love to hear any questions that you have. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions. I, I mean, I have some questions, but I'm going to start with the question from the audience first. Um, so uh, the very first one is, it comes before you mention money role. So basically, I do believe you answered uh, some of this question, but I'm going to read this anyway, cool. so people don't blame me, I don't read the questions. Uh, so what about the money? Was, was this his need to adapt Scrum? So what is, was his need? And how did he see the change happening? Mm. So yeah, so it's interesting. So a lot of the original challenge was getting everyone else to buy into the idea that we had to coach Manny as well. Um, so he believed that we were doing perfect Scrum. That, that was his, uh, and that's because he'd never been an expert in Scrum. He'd never really had any coaching support. Uh, and a funny anecdote was the first time Pete, the product owner, came in from a meeting with, with Manny, obviously not the real names, and uh, he said to me, oh, Alan, the, there you go, I've just given you a real name. Manny, the manager, Manny, the manager has just said to me, I think Mike's trying to coach me. And I was like, yeah, well, at least he realizes, so that's, that's good. Uh, so yes, it was a coaching exercise, right? But ultimately, Manny, he understood, right? He wasn't doing any of this deliberately. He'd just never known anything different, so it just was helping him understand his impact. Uh, so there was a question on what, his, what this uh, was, um, once again, was this his need to adapt the Scrum? So where, where, where this uh, idea of adapting the Scrum comes from? So, so like there was Manny or someone else? Uh, I, Empowering, I, I mean, I suggesting this to their organization. Yeah, so I don't think it was um, necessarily deliberate. I think it was they'd had a person with a Scrum Master hat, hat on that wasn't really a Scrum Master. That person had left, and they, they were told they needed to hire a new one. Uh, and then when a new Scrum Master arrives, they say, hey, this doesn't look right. And, and they just, you know, do what Scrum Masters do. Uh, okay, and the second question I might ask in one minute is, how much influence do we expect from managers? So what is the area of their influence, in your opinion? I mean, I, I suppose that depends on the organization, right? There's, there's always going to be a difference. I think my experience here was that it's very related to how much time people spend together, right? So a manager that's only really there once a sprint is not going to have the same influence as a manager that's there every day and talking to the team. And it might not even be deliberate. They might not be trying to influence the team, but just naturally, the more time they spend with them, the more impact their words and, and ideas are going to have. And so you just kind of have to un help managers to understand that that interaction is different you know, especially with managers who used to be developers or used to be in the team, right? They probably have existing relationships and they're just trying to spend time with the teams and be friendly. And they just need to be helped to understand that sometimes that behavior has to change. All right, thank you very much. I have more questions which I'm not going to ask because of the time box we have. So once again, thank you very much, Mike.